Hello and welcome to Pill Webinar number 72, Spring into Action, a GAO decision on streamlined documentation. And in fact, we are coming to you live from Springfield, Virginia. I'm Scott Simpson from the DHS Procurement Innovation Lab, and I'm joined by my colleague, David Jablonski. Now, Scott, I know that today we have the Department of Education with us on this webinar, so I thought I'd list some facts about spring. Now, the first spring power clock was invented in the 15th century. No, 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 David, it's not that kind of spring. We're talking about the spring, the season, you know, like winter, spring, fall, like it's the season to innovate. Okay, all right, so how about this then? Everyone knows that April showers brings May flowers. Well, way back in 1637, Holland had the great tulip mania where tulips were briefly valued at more than gold. Well, I guess tulips were the dot-com bubble of the 17th century, but we're here to talk about innovation today, David, so let's get going. Let's do a quick orientation of the, the Adobe chat pod for those who haven't been attended before or it's been a while. In the bottom right-hand corner, we have the chat box. This is where you can type your full name and DHS email address for credit. It's very important. It's also where you can submit questions at any time. We have dedicated PILL staff monitoring our chat box, so please, don't leave a question in your hip pocket. In the bottom middle of the screen is where you can find some helpful pill links. And in the top right, you'll find the download box, where you can access and download the documents that we'll be going over today. You can even click the upper right hand drop down to download all, all at once. But unfortunately, that's only for live. You will see some poll questions throughout the presentation, so keep an eye out and be sure to respond. In fact, we have two up right now, so take the poll. Finally, there's a full screen option. Just click the rectangle icon at the top of the box, and when you want to exit, click it again. Well, that wraps up the clerical piece. Let's talk about what happened previously on the pill. Now, previously on the pill. Webinar number 71. Where are they now? Back to the future with U.S. Coast Guard and Fletzi. In this one and a half hour webinar, you will travel back in time to revisit two teams from Coast Guard and Fletzi that were featured from more than four years ago in a pill webinar. You'll learn the innovations used by each team that resulted in improved mission outcomes, how the contract performance is going now, and how the teams are using procurement innovation techniques in the present day, well, from a month ago. You'll also learn about the results from the 2022 DHS OCPO Competing Values Framework, the CVF assessment, which is currently available live for all DHS employees. Now on the line today, today besides David and myself, we have David Geary, Contracting Officer from the U.S. Department of Education. Say hello, David. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. And also from the U.S. Department of Education is Andrew Kolko. Andrew, come on and say hello. Hello, everyone. Now, before we, we are going to hear from them soon, but first, let's go over those poll questions. The poll asks... All right, and poll number one, how many webinars have you attended? Looks like we have 21 of you that have attended. Now, this is your first webinar, so welcome. Hope you have a great time today. Uh, we have 50 people, let's say, between two and four webinars. Uh, between five and seven, we have 51 people. Uh, eight to 10 webinars, we have 18 people. Over 10 webinars, we have 39 people here today for that. Wow, that's amazing. And poll number two, what is your primary role within the acquisition community? It looks like we have 47 of you are contracting officer or contract specialist. We have, uh, we have, let's see here, we have 111 of you are from the program side. That's perfect. We have two attorneys, so welcome attorneys. We have seven people that are program analysts or price analysts, small business specialists. So that's great. And we have 19 others. Well, we're happy to have all of you with us today, and we are very happy to have with us Miss Ann Van Houten. Ann is the Executive Director of the DHS Acquisition Policy and Over Oversight Division. She's here to kick us off with the tone from the top. Ann, thanks for being with us today, and take it away. Thank you so much. Um, Scott and David. Uh, I am so honored to be able to give the tone from the top today. I can't believe this is the 72nd pill webinar. I actually do remember the very first one. And I will say that DHS 
acquisition policy and innovation always have and currently still do really go hand in hand. Innovation puts our policies into practice and our policies support a wide variety of processes that can help you shape your procurements so they meet your needs and, and deliver what the customer needs. And there's nothing more important than this synergy and I think it is the secret sauce that makes us successful. As you're going to hear today, it's not just us who are, are successful with this kind of um, working togetherness. The Department of Education had a really important procurement that they had to award very, very quickly. Sounds like many of the things we do, I know. In order to do so, they took advantage of all the resources they had available to them, including some innovations. This team pushed the boundaries of streamlined documentation and took it to a whole new level. And today, you're going to learn how that team uh, decided what to do, how they managed their risks, and, and how did they get to a great outcome. Now, we, I mentioned that word resources. I got to put in a plug for my team. Um, here at DHS, if you go to DHS Connect and then you go to that little acquisition button, that gives it, that um, web page is the entrance point to give you all sorts of resources that can help you, especially at the beginning stages of your uh, of your procurements. It's got tools, it's got guides, it's got job aids, things like a market research guide, a source selection guide, all sorts of things that can help you shape your procurement to make it efficient and meet your customers' needs. And embedded in each of those are innovations that have been tested and that I highly, highly, highly recommend you consider for your next uh, procurement whenever it makes sense. Now, for our friends outside of DHS, check and see what your agency or your department already has available. There are probably some hidden gems. And don't forget about the acquisition gateway. The tools there and the tools on eBuy and other GSA web pages are great either for finding innovations or just for um, igniting that new idea that causes you to come up with the next thing that hopefully we will feature on a pill webinar. And speaking of that, you know, these webinars, I find them very useful. They are a great source of information and sharing the lessons learned across um, components and even among agencies just makes uh, all of us smarter and makes our procurements better. Another great resource that we don't often think about is using the people around you. And I want to recommend, especially when you first pick up a new uh, PR and you've got a little bit of time, go talk to your policy people. Go talk to your legal advisors. Find out what those trends are that are out there, what's working, and what's the latest in and greatest efficiencies available. Talk to your boss. Talk to you, the folks on your team and talk to your peers as well. Honestly, good ideas and innovations they come from everybody and they come really just from those social chats and picking other people's brains. Now I do want to do a public service announcement and you heard it at, um, from Scott and David in the beginning. Hey, um, don't forget to take your competing values framework survey. Um, the survey ends tomorrow. So don't forget what I'm saying. Uh, what does the survey do? It really measures the DHS culture and it, it assesses how well 
We are balancing our acquisition policies and innovations and our human relations to achieve those great mission outcomes. Most of the folks, because they, from the poll I can tell, uh, who are, are attending the webinar are eligible to take the survey. So if you're a, a contracting officer, a contract specialist, program manager, or a contracting officer representative, please, please, please take that survey. It is short. It takes less than 10 minutes. And honestly, it only took me about five minutes. So it won't take up much of your time. Now, you can get to the survey a couple of different ways. So um, the Acquisition Workforce Communication Team, they sent out a blast email um, yesterday on the 16th. If you can find that email, scroll to the bottom. There's a link there. But I'll bet our Scott and David are really, really good at this and that they can post the link in the chat. So then it's a ah, and I see it, it's available for everybody. Click on that. And then as soon as the webinar is over, take that survey. We need your voice. It's all anonymous and it really, really does help. Now, I want to thank Andrew and David from the Department of Education for sharing their journey and their lessons learned with us. And I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to tune in today. I know you're gonna learn about some great innovative uh, procurement techniques, and I hope you have the opportunity to try this one or maybe some others. Now, I'll turn it back to Scott and David so they can get this webinar started. Thanks. No, thank you, Anne. We really appreciate those inspiring words, and we always appreciate you dropping by. Drop some appreciation in the chat for Anne Van Houten. Thank you very much. Uh, just like Anne was saying there, the CVF assessment is currently open through tomorrow, uh, Friday, May 19, 2023, through the end of the business day. We dropped the chat here uh, in the chat pod, so go ahead and click on that. You can click on it here on the slide as well. Uh, so we know there's a lot of surveys out. We know the FEVs just launched this last week as well. But this one, just as important, it measures the culture of the procurement organization. Uh, so please take the survey if you can. It's uh, We need the feedback, and it's great, and it goes right up to management, and everyone gets to, to see the results so that we can learn more, continue to improve the, the procurement organization and the services that we're providing. All right, so without further ado, let's dive into the webinar itself. So as we all know, we have, uh, we're have we here with the Department of Education team. We're springing into action here, GAO decision on streamlined uh, documentation. And we have a, a really packed agenda today for everybody. Uh, we're going to go over some of the webinar refreshers, meet the team, look at the innovations, what they were buying, and really learn uh, from this team as to what this GAO protest was, what happened. And so uh, you guys can learn forward, and we can all learn forward as a community, as acquisition community. And, you know, just like when we're planting flowers for springtime, uh, you want to keep those flowers maybe in similar types of them together. Now, for our acquisitions, we also need to make sure we're staying in our lane, just like this as well, right? Now, today, this team, they conducted their procurement using FAR 8.4 procedures to purchase uh, the BPA requirement that they needed uh, for these services. We have some great webinar refreshers out there for everybody of similar webinars to this one where you can continue to learn more information about using streamlined documentation and streamlining the procurements that you're using. Uh, so webinar number 52, Efficient Procurement Models That Meet the Mission, a FEMA story. They used advisory down selects on the spot consensus, confidence ratings, and streamlined documentation just like we're going to talk about today. And the other one out there, it's really similar to this one as well, webinar number 37, Paperless Proposals, Shorter Procurement Lead Times for Commercial Services, a Fletzi case study. They used video proposals, oral presentations with dialogue, and streamlined documentation. Um, each of those videos you can find right on the PIL webinar page. You can click the link right here, um, or go to our PIL webinar page. Uh, they can find our DHS Connect page. Now, without further ado, Everyone, please give a warm welcome to David Geary, Contracting Officer from the Department of Education, and Andrew Kolko, the Contracting Officer Representative from the Department of Education. Thank you both for joining us today. Uh, David, can you start off with yourself and tell everyone a little about who you are and, and uh, uh, what you do? 
Sure. Thanks, David. Um, I've been uh, in federal contracting for about 15 years now as an 1102. Uh, three of those years have been with the Department of Education. Uh, I currently live in Denver, Colorado, so I enjoy uh, skiing during the winter. And now that the weather's starting to change, I like to get out and try to camp um, in our mountains and also uh, get out and enjoy a nice round of golf. Perfect. Excellent. Yep, that's right. Get some golfing here in the springtime. Thank you very much, David. Now, Andrew, can you introduce yourself for everyone? Hi, I'm Andrew Kolko. I'm a COR here at the Department of Education. Uh, I've been working in this role for the past 20 years. I've worked on a variety of procurements during that time. Uh, prior to that, I was a contract specialist uh, and then a contracting officer for approximately 10 years, also here at the department. Um, and uh, I enjoy outside activities as well, uh, primarily biking. Very nice. Excellent. Love biking around here as well. Um, so it's perfect. Well, thank you very much for introducing yourselves. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, so the first thing, we want to dive right into the requirements here. Um, spring forward, if you say. And so, Andrew, can you tell everyone here what it is that you were buying for this particular requirement? Sure. Uh, our acquisition community has been uh, asking for a modern procurement system for a long time. <clears throat> the current system has been in use in one form or another since uh, I started here 30 years ago. Uh, it has limitations. Uh, it's difficult to format contracts. It doesn't do planning. It doesn't store all contract files. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we were trying to overcome those uh, limitations in, in our follow-up system. Uh, we knew from the market research that one product uh, was not going to meet all our needs. What we were looking for was a hybrid solution that used a low-code, no-code platform uh, to supplement a core Cox product. Uh, that low-code, no-code platform would be used to implement extensions to bridge any functionality gaps and get us to the future modern state. Perfect. So we're moving from this DOS-based computer with you know all these paper files we see on the left here to a more newer system, and and I think everyone here you know can attest that they would probably want a newer system at DHS, right, or any agency across the government for that matter. Uh, now, what was the dollar value of your particular requirement that you had? Yeah, so we estimated it at about fifty million dollars. Okay, perfect. And uh, now, David, what did your market research show for the requirement? Yeah, so to piggyback off what Andrew said, we did perform market research. We uh, posted a request for information, RFI, on GSA eBuy. Um, that resulted in a lot of responses from small business and kind of guided our acquisition strategy to set it aside for small business on GSA. Okay, got it. So GSA schedules, small business set aside. And now when thinking about the requirement itself, um, how did you end up uh, issuing the solicitation out there? Yeah, we used the, the GSA eBuy system to release that to all uh, small businesses within the SIN uh, that we chose. Okay, got it. So putting it right out there on the eBuy system to the small businesses, so potential to get a lot of vendors participating on this requirement. All right, so now, Andrew, so you're purchasing this new acquisition system. Was there anything in particular that you were looking for in, from a new system for your workforce? Yeah, so the primary objective of this procurement was to implement the modern acquisition management system. And our vision uh, is a one-stop, fully integrated, automated, and adaptive lifecycle acquisition management system that encompasses user-friendly, end-to-end acquisition, business, and financial processes. On top of that, the system has to interview, interface with uh, our Oracle financial system. Uh, ultimately, we're trying to get rid of cost systems and bring all work into the AMS. Um, and on top of that, it needs to work seamlessly and provide an optimal user experience for the department stakeholders. Got it. Okay, so this new system, getting all these new functions and features for your workforce itself. Um, now, David, so what was the timeline that you're looking to really purchase this requirement in? Yeah, since this requirement touched so many departments within our uh, Department of Education, uh, we initially planned to do about six months of market research and develop our requirement, you know, have user meetings uh, to help with that, uh, and then another six months to um, do the acqu actual acquisition, so about a year altogether. 
Got it. So one year. Okay. Now, you guys, when were you approached with this? Because remember, we we're talking about this, and you know, you, you you were approached with this in the middle of FY22, right? But when was that? When you're told, "Hey, we have a requirement," and you know, uh, you know, this is when this is when we need it. What, what was that the discussion look like? Yeah. So it was about this time last year, about um, about April, is when we started to you know really dive into our market research and starting to look at that, um, and. About that time, uh, we were under the impression that we need to get all that done um, and solicited in FY23, and then all of a sudden the decision was made that it needed to be done by the end of FY22, which is September 30th. Wow, okay, got it. So you got the requirement right about now in May, and uh, <laughs> you thought you had over a year to do it. But instead, well, no, nope, you're going to get it done this fiscal year. So you all had to move pretty quickly, right? Exactly. Yes, we did. Got it. Okay. And uh, and I know that can present a timeline, a tight time. So you got to act quickly here. And uh, and so because of that, you know, you really need to make sure that you're using some innovations to kind of speed up the process itself. Now, these are all the innovation techniques that this team used on this particular requirement. And now, obviously, we're going to be focusing in a lot on the streamlined documentation, but we're going to cover a little bit of all these as part of the story itself. Now, Andrew, how did you know that you wanted to use procurement innovation techniques for this particular requirement from your seat as a core? Yeah, so, you know, as David mentioned, we didn't have a lot of time since the final decision to move forward with this effort uh, didn't come until late in the fiscal year. Uh, and given that timeline, I knew it would be difficult to do this using traditional methods. Um, so, I also, I just, I think that, um, Doing it this way, uh, using the innovations, is a much better way of doing procurements uh, rather than doing uh, reading stacks of proposals and writing reams of documentation. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so you really want to get through this quickly, and and, uh, and I think some great reasons there as to why you want to use it. And uh, before we hop into to David's thoughts about you know what uh, Andrew thought when he approached him, uh, we have a poll question up, so you can all get to that. Uh, take the poll question here. Um, which of the following pill techniques have you used in the past, either as a formal pill project or on your own? All right. So now, David, what did you think when Andrew approached you and asked to use some of these procurement innovation techniques as part of the requirement? Well, Andrew and I had worked uh, the previous year on another large, high-profile procurement uh, using some of the pill um, innovation techniques. Uh, so when he approached me with this one and under the time crunch that we did have, uh, I was kind of happy that um, we were on the same page and we saw it from the same perspective of that, you know, these, these techniques really do help um, shorten the timeline and help it be a little more efficient altogether. That's pretty awesome. So you guys are pretty much in sync here then. You wanted to use it, Andrew. David, you wanted to use it as well. Um, so now that we know about all the different innovative techniques this team is using, let's dive into the acquisition strategy for this particular requirement. So almost like the seasons of the year here, we, ha we have three phases, so not quite four. We have three phases for this requirement. And uh, now, David, your team did this procurement really quickly. Look at this, three phases and only 74 days from the issuance of the solicitation. Can you walk us through your acquisition strategy? Sure, yeah, so like the slide says, um, our phase one, um, we asked for a, a five-page um, experience from all vendors. Uh, we then evaluated that and moved into phase two, um, which was the oral presentations and written key personnel uh, with the live demonstration where we were able to ask questions and answers during that phase. Uh, phase three was then the technical approach uh, of the DPA itself, uh, along with the cost, the Agile Development Management Plan, and the pricing. All right. So... Now, was there anything challenging about using this three-phase approach for this particular procurement? I would say, uh, besides the timing <laughs> that we had to get it done in, uh, the phase two demonstrations, even though they were great, and I think they really helped our evaluator, uh, fitting nine into one week was very, um, very tough, uh, you know, with everybody's schedule and trying to get everybody um, available for those. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, okay. Now, I want to point this out here. I know Scott put this in the chat here. This team worked together early in the process, and they were very quick with the evaluation between the phases in addition to the overall. So we're looking here only seven days between phase one and two. 
and 11 days of evaluation before evaluating nine vendors between today's is two and three. So I know we're going to dive more into how they evaluated these vendors so quickly in each phase, but it's really important to note here that these evaluations were very quick. They work together early in the process. And we're going to cover the poll results here for poll question number three. Scott, what is everyone saying out there about the innovation techniques they've used? We've got a lot of people who've used a lot of innovation techniques. 40% have used oral presentations. A little more than 20% have used on-the-spot consensus. About the same for advisory down selects. 33% of people use confidence ratings. That's excellent. And there's about 44 people that say, not yet. That's why I'm here. So let's keep going. Now, David, so um, I know we've had some conversations on this. And as you can see here on the screen, we have Grants Management, uh, Pill Project number 122 from FY 2021. And then obviously the Acquisition Management System, Pill Project 144, FY 2022. Um, now, this previous project, uh, did you use a similar approach uh, to what you used here on this acquisition management system? If so, can, can you tell everyone about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, it was uh, um, uh, the requirement was to replace our grants management system or upgrade it. Um, so we used the three phases similar to the, the one we did with AMS. Uh, and we were actually under a very similar time frame, too, where we had to get done by the end of the fiscal year of 2021. Uh, so, with that being said, um, a lot of these techniques did work really well for us to meet our um, required timeline, and I think that's what kind of trickled into our decisions on what we use for this acquisition management system procurement. Were there any lessons learned that you had from the grants management requirement? Yeah, so again, the, the three phases work really well. I think that uh, the, the, most, um, um, the most feedback I got from the evaluators were on the phase two with the live demonstrations. Uh, just really helped the, the evaluators see it in live, um, in live uh, over the team chat that we did um, the presentations on. And then after each presentation, we did the on-the-spot consensus, which really helped kind of make sure that all the evaluators were consistent and we got those done timely. That's great. And so got some lessons learned from the previous one, apply them to this particular procurement. I think it's a really great point here that there are a lot of solicitation examples that can be used as starting places. Uh, then you can lift and shift what you need to your requirements itself. So just like the question that Sharon had on here about could it work on a multiple award too? It could work, right? But you make it adapted to fit your requirement as to what it is that you need. Uh, there's great resources out there on the periodic table of acquisition innovations. Uh, just like Ann said earlier, you can contact a friend in the office or someone else that's maybe purchased something similar to see what they've done. Uh, or you could contact your acquisition innovation advocate at your component to see if they have examples they could connect you with as well. Um, so we're going to go on here to our, our next slide to cover on the phase one experience, but we have a, a poll question here. And Scott, can you cover that for everybody? That's right. Our poll asks, for a requirement of this size and complexity, remember, a $50 billion BPA, how long should the written submission be for prior experience? Take the poll. Let us know what you think. Perfect. All right. So again, we're springing into the first phase of the requirement itself. Um, Andrew, can you walk us through what it is that you're asking vendors to submit as part of this phase one? Sure. So uh, vendors had to submit a short five-page write-up of their prior experience performing work of similar size, scope, and complexity uh, that occurred in the past five years. And we also had a requirement that they must be certified CMMI uh, Dev 3 by the time of contract award. Okay. And so why was this information important to your agency and for this requirement? So we felt that it was very important from the start that the vendor had experience doing what we were looking for and that this wasn't going to be their first effort. Uh, we also wanted to ensure that they had proven development processes in place, which was the rationale behind the CMMI requirement. Got it. Okay. Now, so you're asking for this five pages of experience from the vendors uh, on this information. Now, was did you get enough information from the vendors in these five pages to, to make a decision and to be able to down select to the next phase? Uh, yeah, ultimately did. Um, for some of the responses, it was difficult to determine what the role, the, uh, what role the offerer played in the effort uh, or 
if it was really of similar size and, and scope. Uh, but, you know, I think that ended up showing up in their confidence ratings um, that we gave them. Got it, got it, got it. Perfect. Okay, so, and you just described it in there. If you didn't have enough information, uh, so you just documented it on your actual evaluation of them, correct? Correct. Perfect. Okay. Now, David, uh, did you, you included another layer to this as an option if you needed it. Uh, what was it that you included in the solicitation language? Yeah, uh, we did include some language in the RFQ um, that gave us the ability to reach back to um, any identified representative of the government agency or company for reference check um, to go ahead and kind of verify that, you know, the demonstrated prior experience matched um, what they were saying, and as well as um, reaching back to their CPARS evaluation. Okay. And, and here, right here in phase one, did you use that at all? Did you call anyone as part of that process? Uh, for the phase one, um, we didn't actually call anybody, but we still had that right to do that. We did reach back um, to look at their CPARs, um, which, again, it was part of that language. Got it, got it, got it. Perfect. Now, this is what we like to call flexible language, right? You reserve the right to do something in your solicitation so that you can if you want to, but you're not required if you don't find that it's necessary. So let us know in the chat here, have you all ever used flexible language like this before in your solicitations where you reserve the right to do something, but you didn't have to if you didn't feel like it was necessary? Let us know in the chat. And while you're putting that in the chat, Scott's going to cover the poll full results for us. That's right. We asked uh, how many pages you would do for corporate experience, and it looks like everyone kind of said about what uh, David and Andrew had here. 77%, 78% now said three to five pages, with a few percent saying uh, five to ten, and a few percent saying one to two. So you, it sounds like everyone had the right approach, and it looks like there's not many people in the chat, but there are a few who have used that flex flexible language you were just talking about, David. That's pretty cool. That's great to know that people, some people have, a lot of people haven't though. So when you guys are using your next procurement, think about that. You can include uh, these types of things in your solicitation, that flexible language, or even potentially an optional factor if you find that it's necessary. So um, great feedback, everybody. Thank you very much for, for that and keep the... All right, so now here we're going to move on to our next slide and we're going to dive into this phase one evaluation here. So we talked earlier how this is going to be an FY23 award, but instead it was done in FY22. That was a, a quick switcheroo there on your, right, Andrew? All right, David? So, uh, so you guys had to move fast. So you received 12 quotes in phase one, and you finished evaluating those quotes in just seven days. Now, David, can you walk us through the process of how your team evaluated those quotes so quickly? Yeah, sure. So after the, we received all phase one submissions, uh, we met with all the evaluators, including myself, um, and we kind of just w briefly scrubbed all of them uh, just to make sure that they adhered to our RFQ requirements and there wasn't anything that was an outlier. Um, and then we gave the evaluators about four days uh, to do all 12 of those evaluations and to make their confidence rating note. Um, and then after that, we did reconvene and went one by one uh, on each submission to make our consensus evaluation. So, so to help you move really fast, what was it that you documented for each of the vendors? Yeah, we documented uh, kind of the things that are showing up on the screen. Uh, kind of specifically, we got in to make sure that their CMI uh, development level three uh, were certified. Um, we also made sure that the, their three recent relevant examples uh, that they provided um, also met the dollar value, as well as they had experience uh, using low code platforms or programs. Perfect, perfect. Okay, got it. All right, now from the contracting officer perspective, so what was your level of involvement of each of these evaluation meetings that you had for all 12 vendors? Yeah, it was part of the, uh, every evaluation uh, meeting. Uh, even though I wasn't actually an evaluator myself, it did help me stay aware of the discussions happening. It helped me kind of guide the evaluators and making sure that they stayed on task. Um, and it also helped me, um, you know, stay on schedule with the procurement, being involved as much as I was. Okay. Now, had you evaluated like this before where you were actually involved with the meetings itself, or is this the first time you've ever done that? 
Uh, yeah, a, um, kind of the example that we gave prior that I worked with Andrew on, the grants management acquisition. Uh, again, being such a short time frame that we had to get it done in, uh, I was present in all those meetings and it worked so well that I decided to replicate it in the acquisition management system procurement. That's very cool. Okay. Now, so was being there in the room helpful for like writing your source selection decision memo and those other award decision memos? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know if, uh, if I wasn't involved in those meetings, if we would have made the, the deadline that we had, uh, just because I would have had to, you know, try to reach back and, and get some information. But uh, I was making my own notes throughout the process, so that way uh, I could kind of take those and, and add those to my contract documents that I had for the file. Okay, got it. And I think that's something we want to pause here for everyone. I know we have a lot of cores in the room itself, um, a lot of the, some contracting officers too. That's the biggest groups we have. But this is very important. The contracting officer can be there in the room as part of the valuation. You're not voting on it, but you're listening in, providing that feedback. So you don't have to have any other conversation afterwards or send documentation back to the program office to have them change something, right? So this is very important. This really helps speed up the process. And as you can see here, it helped this team too significantly. Um, so let's see here. So you finished the phase one evaluation. You're moving really quickly here. Uh, and uh-oh, uh -oh, April showers, everybody. I think we have a protest. But before we get into this protest, we do have a poll question that we're going to cover here. So uh, let's go over this really quickly. Uh, so the poll question is, have you ever had a procurement protested? Go ahead and answer that. And Scott here is going to go ahead and cover what was actually protested. Scott, floor's all yours. So this was a post-award protest. But we're talking about it in the middle here so that, because this is the part that it references. Here, the protester argued that the, uh, the chart you saw on the previous slide, well, they argue the agency didn't properly justify its evaluation findings in that contemporaneous record. If you notice on the chart, the left and right columns had the same information, but the ratings at the bottom were different, and the protester said, hey, what gives? What's the difference about? The agency responded to say, well, the difference is based on the descriptions that you provided in your offer. Your proposal had an offer. We said, that's what it was all about. No other documentation needed. The GAO found, well, that's not quite enough. Here, the only contemporaneous record is that chart with questions that are mostly yes or no. The agency identified one basis for a distinction, but it wasn't included in the contemporaneous record. That is, the record of the evaluation at the time that was submitted to GAO. And so, there was no basis for the agency's unequal evaluation of the two vendors. So, they didn't like the chart. They wanted a little bit more information. They said, protest sustained. Okay, so we want to remind everyone here, this is the post-war protest. We said here we have the full protest itself up in the downloads box at B421196 Remedy Biz Inc. So go ahead and click on that if you want to read the full protest results itself. Um, this is not the only thing protested by the vendor either. There were a couple of other points that we're going to get to later on in the webinar. Both of those were actually uh, denied. They, uh, they were denied for, uh, for the protest parts. And, and so we're going to get into that in full detail later on so you can hear more about it. But you can read the full thing right in the downloads box. Um, so now we're going to skip over here. Oh, and we got to look at our poll question too. So, Scott, can you cover the poll results for us? I would love to. There are a few people out there that said, yes, they have received protests and it was sustained, but there are just a few people. Most people said, yes, but it was dismissed or denied, 35%, and 61%, 62 now say, no, they've never received a protest. So, there you have it. All right, so we'll learn more about this protest here and then how your team dealt with this a little bit. And so... Uh, now, David, prior to finding out that this protest was sustained, or part of it was sustained, uh, when your team was notified of the protest from the vendor, was there any discussion that your team had about taking corrective action, potentially, prior to GAO coming up with their ruling? Uh, we actually waited to hear back from GAO on their ruling and what their corrective action was, just because we felt like that our evaluation was pretty solid. Um, so again, we wanted to wait to see what exactly they were how they viewed it. Got it. Okay, so you want to hear what v uh, GAO, how they're going to rule on this. 
And uh, so we, we, we have this protest and the evaluation prior to prior experience in phase one that was sustained here, this part. Um, what was the corrective action that GAO required from your team? Yeah, you, like you mentioned, they, they did protest on a couple of different grounds, uh, but GAO only required us to reevaluate phase one in the corrective action. Okay, and was it? Did they require you to reevaluate all of the vendors from phase one, or was there anything that they uh, stated as part of it that you had to do? No, we didn't have to evaluate all vendors. Luckily, um, we just had to reevaluate uh, for phase one for the protester and the awardee. Okay, so just those two vendors, and um, and so uh, just to make note that the GAO did have a recommendation to reevaluate everyone. It was just say you may consider. So remember the mays and shalls. So they didn't say they had to. So they only had to do the the protesting vendor and the awardee itself to really look over that information. Um, and so now, uh, what did you do as part of that process? What was your process of the reevaluation? Yeah, so uh, during the initial uh, evaluation under phase one, uh, we didn't feel like it was necessary to reach out. Um, like I said, we include that language that we had the ability to, if we needed to, reach out to uh, previous contacts on their on their contract performance. Um, but at this time, uh, during the reevaluation, we found that, you know, just to do our due diligence, we did reach back out to the government point of contact to confirm, uh, you know, the performance and the scope of what they had done previously on contract. Okay. Got it. And so, so you look back, uh, let's see here. I think we have a question in the chat. Um, how long did you have to wait for GAO to get back to you as part of uh, their, I guess, the whole due diligence on the protests? Do you remember that timeline uh, there? Yeah, I'm going to say it was, it was roughly about 90 days. I mean, they took their, uh, and again, I have to, again, we have to consider that it was around the holiday. So, you know, there's a lot of people that take breaks and whatnot, but yeah, they took the full, about their full time to, to get back to us. I think Sandra put it there in the chat as well. It must be decided upon in 100 calendar days. So, uh, so 90 days. Hey, they, they hit it though. So, but there is time on that, and there are requirements on GAO's site. It explains everything right on GAO.gov about what that bid protest timeline looks like as well. Um, okay, so you got the protests. Uh, you went ahead and you uh, made those calls afterwards. Go ahead and do your due diligence. Really make sure who you were selecting was correct, and then you go ahead and reaward it. So. After you rewarded it, did the vendor were they, was there a subsequent protest at all from any vendor or this particular vendor that protested before? So after our reevaluation, uh, we provided those um, notices back out to the awardee and the protester. Uh, again, we didn't change the awardee, and uh, there was no uh, subsequent protest afterward. That's great news. Okay, great to hear. So you rewarded it. Uh, no subsequent protest. That is great. Okay. Now, I think this is a great educational moment for everyone on the webinar today. So you're only required, remember, to evaluate what GAO requires to be reevaluated. You don't have to reevaluate everything and open everything back up again, um, and which then could put you in a situation where they could protest things if you reevaluate everything again. So you only have to focus on what they say you have to focus on um, as part of your corrective action if something is sustained. Um, and so now we're going to move on here, and we actually have an exercise that we're going to do here right in the middle of the webinar. Um, so we're going to proceed forward here to our exercise layout, to our first kind of two exercises for the day. So Scott, why don't you take us away and show whatever we have here. So we've got an exercise for you, and we're going to try some of the new features in Adobe. This one's called Rank It, and it's your turn. So summer is coming. I would like to have an ice cream truck for the office summer party. Wouldn't we all like to have an ice cream truck for the summer party? I think it's just going to be delicious. So these are, we've had uh, ice cream trucks in the past, and the things that you see on the screen there, well, those are some of the evaluation factors that we used the last time. You can go ahead and you can drag and drop those ones around, just any order you think they are. Put them in the most, from the most important to the least important or the least useful and then hit the submit answer at the bottom there and we'll take a look to see what people think about that we don't always suggest starting with uh, the uh, evaluation factors that you used the last time a lot of times we suggest starting fresh and saying what's most important to you all but here for the sake of this exercise we wanted to have some of the uh, 
approaches that are most used, you know, like technical and management approach, as well as some more um, innovative approaches as well to see which ones you think are most important. So go ahead, take about uh, 10 seconds to rank those from most important to least important or most useful to least useful, and then hit your submit button and we'll uh, take a look at the results. This is the first time we've used this. We'll see how the tool works. David, are we ready to see what it looks like? I am ready, yes. Let's see your results. View results. Wow. All right, so it looks like we have a point scale here. Uh, and so it looks like most people are rating. Oh, it changes. Ah, look at that. Experience five pages is the highest one. Then we have this past performance CPARS as the second. That's interesting. Uh, technical approach, 20 pages. I'm surprised it's as high as it is. Oral presentation for an hour. Price, then management approach, 20 pages. Okay, got it. I love the experience that that's being rated way much further ahead than everyone else. Um, and the past performance, though, is past performance something we always have to look at, Scott, for all of our requirements? I think. And when is it required, Scott? You know, it's only required if it's non-commercial and you're in that 15.3 realm. That's the only time it's really required. Other times, you can write a waiver, you can uh, document the file to say, hey, past performance is not going to be an, uh, a discriminator here. Let's go on to the next part. We've got another part of this exercise for y'all. So, we have the ice cream party set up. We are looking at corporate experience here. Um, we're, we want, what are some questions that we can include in the solicitation as part of a light but meaningful phase one factor. We saw a couple of the questions that David and Andrew included. They had some pretty light but meaningful questions. Why don't you drop in the question in the chat what some light but meaningful questions in corporate experience could be for this corporate ice cream party. Again, they should be short. Um, we talked earlier, we had a poll that said we're probably going to have between three and five pages. So we don't want anything too, too, um, too long. And of course, a best practice is to keep price in the second phase. I like where uh, uh, Miss Mackey is going. She wants to sample them. I want to sample too. Can we flavor the cones? What's the size? Are there dairy-free or sugar-free options? Do you provide that? What types of, my goodness, they're coming in fast and furious here. What types of toppings do you offer? What types of cones are there? What is the most person, here's a great one from Sharon Brown. What is the most number of people you have served in a in a, in a an event? That's a really great one to talk about. Uh, talk about that. Uh, another one is what is the largest function you have supported? Another really great one. What options do you provide for toppings? How many servers, or how will you handle large lines? That's an amazing one, right? How will you handle large lines? That kind of goes to the question about. Tell me a time when something didn't go quite as you planned, and what was your remediation? We want to know, do you really have experience with this? And if you've got experience with the ice cream well, well then you've had long lines, and you'll, be, you'll know how, um, how to deal with them. But if you don't, well, maybe you're not going to know how, um, how to deal with long lines. Lots of great options in here. Some of them are, are givens, right? Like, what about health code certifications? Is that a requirement? Our market research is going to show us whether that's a requirement or not. And if they are required to have a health code certification, then maybe I don't need to ask it during the ex during the uh, solicitation. These are these are just amazing questions. Uh, David, do you want to call out anyone that you saw? I like this. What are the age groups uh, that you have experience with? That's great. Maybe they're little kids. Maybe it's adult ice cream parties. Um, maybe you have that, you know, uh, the you know the truck that comes and they don't have music and they're not catering to the kids, but it's more of an adult crowd. That's a great question. Yeah, definitely for I think a DHS crowd, there would not be as many uh, kids who wanted sprinkles on their ice cream cone. So well, this is a great exercise, David. I'll turn it back over to you to keep going with the content. Perfect. All right, so we're gonna switch back over and we're gonna go to page 17 here and. So uh, so now we're moving on. We're getting to the second phase of the procurement, everybody. And we're between the phases, right? This is that down select uh, between the phases, phase one and phase two. And now the solicitation language uh, said here that your team intended to invite no more than five offers or five vendors to this second phase. But here we could see we went from 12 vendors to nine. 
So, David, how many vendors did your team actually end up inviting to that second phase of the procurement? Yeah, we, we try to stay true to the RFQ, what we, what we uh, anticipated, and we did um, in, um, notify five vendors to participate in phase two. Okay, got it. So you did notify the five vendors, but you had nine. Were you all surprised that so many vendors didn't take the recommendation uh, from that uh, down select that you had sent out? Yeah, we were surprised. I, I mean, um, with the previous procurement, like I said, um, with the grants management, we did um, send out the same uh, five, and we only had one vendor not take our advice, and here we had about four, uh, which made it, that's why we had nine. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. Now, thinking back to this procurement itself, do you think there is anything that you could have potentially done differently, from your opinion, in the solicitation as part of the process that may have resulted in a different outcome, maybe more of those four vendors that didn't take the advice taking your advice? Yeah, in my opinion, I think that um, we could have maybe included another statement just to re reiterate uh, the importance of phase one um, and how much weight it carried. Just so the vendors knew if they weren't um, one of the most uh, highly rated uh, amongst the offers at that point, um, they were highly unlikely to receive an award. I got it. I think that's great advice for everyone. I think great feedback or great insight as to maybe what you would do differently kind of the next time around as part of the process. Now, uh, next year, we want to make sure, we wanted to take the opportunity to share some helpful tips for everyone out there that this team did uh, and not all times you know it's an advisory down select so people don't have to take the advice but here are some great tips for everyone here uh, that you can take and use on your next procurement if you're using advisory down select so without further ado let's go to the top four now scott can you cover number four for us you should definitely allow 48 to 72 hours after sending the advisory notice for offers to decide whether they should proceed or not. We talk about that in the FEMA COVID vaccination story from last year. All right, tip number three, provide enough time, 10 days to three weeks between the phases so that offers do not need to develop the next phase submission before receipt of the advisory notice and state that in the solicitation too. Your turn, Scott. Number two, keep phase one factors light but meaningful. And David, the number one one is? The number one is the factors in phase one should be the most important and must be included as part of the overall trade-off. So there you go, four top tips for if you're doing advisory down selects in your next procurement. Now, here we are uh, going into the second phase and you all had some oral presentations as part of that process. So. Um, Andrew, can you walk us through what vendors were required to present on at the oral presentations and any other submission requirements as part of the phase two requirements? Sure. Uh, we gave the offerers 45 minutes for their presentations, followed by 15 minutes for their Q&A. <laughs> First, we asked uh, for a brief introduction where they presented their teaming partners and key personnel. Uh, next, they were to present their technical approach, including the technical capabilities of their COT solution, the capabilities of any peripheral tools they had proposed, uh, and their approach to converting data from the legacy system. Uh, next, they presented their implementation approach, uh, including how they used agile development, how they would implement the core contract writing system features, and any low-code, no-code extensions they proposed, and how they would train users. Uh, finally, they were to uh, present their change management approach uh, for bringing stakeholders on board. Got it. And uh, and so we have a poll question here as well that we're gonna we're gonna put up for that we're gonna cover. Um, so Scott, can you read that poll real quick, and then we'll go back in here to how your team evaluated it. We ask, when doing an oral presentation, would you use a video recording as the official record? So let us know in the poll. Perfect. Thank you very much, Scott. So we had all these requirements. Um, you also had a slides that were submitted, and there was also key personnel resumes. Now, so Andrew, so your team watched nine oral presentations. Uh, was there anything that surprised you about the information presented at the oral presentation sessions? I wouldn't say big surprises, uh, but it was helpful to see and hear from the members of the team that could potentially be working with us. 
<laughs> I think it gave us a better feeling that they understood it, what we were looking for. Um, and vendors were, were required to have their key personnel at the presentations. Uh, some of the offerers chose to have different members of the team present their areas of expertise. Um, and some of them had a single speaker. I think it gave us more confidence when we heard from the whole team as opposed to just one person. I think that's great insight from everyone that you can include that as part of your documentation as well about the confidence you get from who presented and what do they talk about. Uh, now, with the 15 minutes of Q&A after the presentation, now David, did your team use all of that time, some or all of that time, to ask any questions? Yeah, uh, we definitely maximized that time. And typically we've had about 8 to 10 questions that we would ask um, and receive answers on. Okay. And now, uh, what types of questions did you ask? And uh, was it from everyone asking questions, all your technical team members, or was it just you as a CEO kind of controlling that flow? Yeah, we made the decision that I would act as the moderator just to kind of help, um, you know, maximize that 15 minutes that we had. So the rest of the government team remained silent. Uh, the questions that we, we would mainly ask were more um, technical focus um, about the hosting platform, uh, the integration into our current apps, uh, security, and a little bit more on the conversion specifics. Got it. Perfect. And if you want access to some of those questions that they asked, it's actually in the downloads as well, the oral presentation sample questions. So you can see some of the questions that this team was asking as part of the this Q&A portion, the interactive dialogue of the presentation. Now, Andrew, from your perspective as a core, uh, did the questions help your team, the technical team, better understand the information presented from the vendors at the oral presentation session? Yeah, definitely. Uh, in most cases, uh, they were able to clarify things we didn't understand about their approach. And now, um, oh, here we go. Now, Jessica has a question for us. Uh, were the questions vetted prior to asking them? So I guess, you know, David, as the contracting officer, did you vet these questions prior to asking them as part of this interactive dialogue session? Yeah, so um, what we did is after the 45-minute presentation, we did take a 10-minute break. And re reminder that this was all done on the Teams application um, virtually. So we did go into our own breakout room and spent, spent about 10 minutes with the evaluators and myself. Um, and then we had a scribe that kind of um, noted all the, the questions that we had. So we were under kind of the gun as well to come up with the questions. I vetted them. And then we went back into the uh, overall demonstration live meeting with the contractor. And that's when the questions were asked. Perfect. Excellent, David. That's great. So you got to get a good sense of how that process worked and how the interactive dialogue for this team worked itself. Now, as you saw earlier, uh, it only took 11 days between phase two submissions and sending out the next phase down select notices. So what did your oral presentation schedule look like, David, to get through this in just 11 days, at least nine presentations? Yeah. Um, like I mentioned earlier, nine presentations in one week, that was a pretty heavy load. Um, so each day that uh, we did, we try to fit in two a day. So we had a morning session um, where we had, again, the hour presentation or the 45-minute presentation, the 15-minute Q&A, um, and then we would do our consensus right afterwards. And that was about um, about 30 minutes, I would say, on average, uh, that we got all into a room or, or on our virtual room. Uh, and then we would break for lunch, and then we'd have an afternoon session, do the same thing. We'd have a 45-minute presentation, 15-minute Q&A, and then a consensus about 30 minutes. Got it. So, so you're doing these pretty quickly, did the consensus, everything. Um, and uh, so, you know, I guess for each of these itself, did you, uh, so you had a scribe as part of the meeting. Was there anything else that, you know, helped you get through these, I guess, so quickly and efficiently? Yeah, those consensus meetings to have them right afterwards. Um, again, I think that was vital. And like I said before, is, is to keep us on track, to keep that, um, those presentations fresh and all the evaluators' memories uh, so that we can put that on paper and like the, uh, the, the scribe really helped as well to kind of make sure that um, we were documenting our, our uh, notes that uh, either raised our confidence or lowered our confidence, and then that way it kind of directed us to um, the overall consensus rating. Perfect. Okay, that's great. So we got an idea of how you got through it so quickly. That's very important because you are very efficient with this. Now, thinking here about the record. Now, FAR 8.4 uh, doesn't have any information as to what is required 
in the record itself. Remember everyone, it's only FAR 15 where you'll find prescriptive information as the types of things that could be in the record. It could be the, the transcription, it could be a, a, a video recording, it could be uh, the notes for the government team itself. And now we know this FAR 8.4 BPA, so what ended up serving as your team's record for the oral presentations, David? Yeah, so within phase two, we did request that uh, offers um, did submit uh, a slide deck with their their quote, um, and that helped us to kind of use it as a tool to refer back to. Because again, you know, when you have nine presentations all in one week, they start to kind of blend together. Uh, so that that was a very helpful tool, and we also use it um, as a document for the file as well. Okay, got it. Um, great feedback for everyone. So we're concluding phase two here. Your team took only 11 days to listen to oral presentations, read the resumes. Uh, so what happened next? So yeah, after our evaluations, we did send out the advisory notices. Uh, we gave the vendors, um, uh, I want to say 48 hours to respond to that. And then once that was done, we knew who was going into the next phase. Uh, we gave them two weeks to provide or uh, to work on their phase three submissions and uh, have that submitted over to us. Perfect. All right. So we got two weeks now. We're going to get ready for the next phase, but uh, I know we're moving fast. Before they do that, we have a poll results. Let's see those poll results. Scott, what do we got here uh, from this poll results? So we asked, uh, when doing an oral presentation, what do you use for the official record? Uh, and some people said, uh, yes, the video recording. I think that is what's required by regulation, 17%. But of course, that's not required by regulation. In 15.3, that is an option. But in 8.4, you don't even have to have a record. Yes, that's what my legal re representative says, is about 3%. Uh, and then that is about 46% that says, no, notes or context consensus documentation is enough. I think that's a great answer. And uh, yes, it's just a personal preference. Hey, that's a good answer too, because you're recognizing that it's not required. That's just your personal preference, 21%. Finally, some people say, no, I don't do oral presentations. Well, maybe you consider them after hearing from David and Al, uh, Andrew today. Before we break on to the next phase, though, we got some top tips for everyone out there for using oral presentations yourself. Uh, a lot of these, which this team actually used, too. Uh, so, Scott, do you want to start us off with top tip number six? Number six, do not in independently review resumes. Always pair them with a part of oral presentations. Number five. Number five, pair with on-the-spot consensus to evaluate immediately afterwards. Number four. Ensure the right offerer key personnel are present at the oral presentation. Number three. Do not separately evaluate oral presentation slides. Number two. Make sure to right size your oral presentations to your requirement. David and Andrew here had just had a one hour, 45 minute oral presentation, 15 minute Q&A. Was that the right size for them? And number one, David. Replace, don't add. So we want to substitute things for oral presentation, not add on to them. So all these things which this team did, so it's an awesome job, but takeaways for you all so you can think about this when doing your next uh, requirement. All right here, so now we're moving on to the phase three of the requirement. Andrew, can you walk everyone through what was being required or requested from vendors in this phase three? Uh, sure. Um, in phase three, uh, we requested the uh, technical quote, uh, which consisted of the technical approach for the BPA, uh, performance work statement uh, for task order one, which is the implementation of the AMS. In this case, we uh, used an SOO statement of objectives since we weren't sure how uh, to define exactly what we wanted. Uh, we also asked for a 10-minute video submission, a quality assurance surveillance plan, an agile development plan, <laughs> and uh, the business quote with pricing workbook. A lot of stuff here. Um, and so I, I think this is a large amount of information. We have a question from Ronald about uh, where can you find the attachments to the RFQ. So the first one, attachment four in the downloads box. If you scroll down to the bottom downloads box, you'll find the performance work statement, the solicitation, uh, all that information right up there in the downloads. So you can download those and look through those uh, at your leisure. Um, all right. So large amount of information uh, being requested here you're receiving from vendors uh, in comparison to some of the previous two phases. Now, uh, your team is still able to complete this phase and the evaluations in only nine days. And you had four vendors here in this uh, second, in this third phase. So David, what was your evaluation approach to evaluate the quotes so quickly in this phase? 
Uh, yeah, similar to what we did in the phase one, um, but with obviously fewer vendors, we went from 12 uh, down to four. So again, we gave the evaluators approximately five days to review um, their phase three submissions. And then we met afterwards and um, over again a team's virtual meeting and, and then we did our consensus that way. Okay, got it. Now I see this note here about a PWS video that was requested from vendors. What was it and was it helpful at all? Yeah, that was uh, something that we had not done before. It was a short 10 minute synopsis video of the PWS. Um, again, it was just a tool that we were trying to have for the evaluators to make sure that they felt comfortable on their final evaluation. Um, and from the feedback I got um, from the evaluators, it seemed very helpful. Got it. Now, the process your team took to evaluate the proposals, very impressive, right? Now, looking back at this phase three, um, are there any lessons learned or things that you may have done differently with the process here in this third phase? I think taking into consideration, again, that our, our timeline was so short on this, um, we might reconsider the PWS uh, video. Uh, just because of um, the burden it might have put on the vendors, uh, just a little bit of feedback I got. Um, again, they only had two weeks to, to put all this together. So um, if we did have a little bit more time, I would probably consider keeping it in there. But for this specific one, um, probably reconsider based on our timeline. Okay, great feedback. Now, what about you, Andrew? Is there anything that you think you may have changed at all when looking back at this phase? <clears throat> yeah, I think... Um... I think we, I, I agree with David. I, I don't know if we necessarily needed the videos, but um, yeah, yeah, that, that's about the only thing that I would change. Okay, got it. I, I think great feedback. Identified something. Um, remember, this team had to act quickly, right? End of the fiscal year. Uh, they used the previous requirement as an example, made some tweaks to it to change it, improve it, things that you thought you may need to use. And remember, you all could do the same thing out there. So I think it's great always a lessons learned um, that you can have as well. Um, We've got a question from Jessica and she asks, was there a template of the PWS provided to vendors to ensure vendors included all of the elements the government was looking for to be addressed? Uh, David, Andrew, how did you make sure that they addressed all of the elements you wanted in the PWS? Yeah, we didn't provide a template. Yeah, we did. But... I'm sorry, go ahead, David. Go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> no, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, so, but, um, I mean, we, we made clear in the SOO what we were looking for, and, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they were free to follow their own. Um, unless, am I forgetting something, David? No, I mean, uh, the only thing I can remember is, uh, based on that, is, is there was quick questions and answers that we allowed um, within each phase. And I think that was something that came up, um, you know, just to make sure that they were having consistent um, formatting within that. And so we answered that during our question and answer phase. Great feedback there. Um, okay, so trying something new here, everyone. And, and uh, just like we we're talking about, always try something new. Change your requirement. Make it fit what you need. But don't be afraid to try something new, um, just like Ann was talking about earlier. All right, so... Uh, now here we have some text on the screen and blue text. We're, we're to the trade-off decision, okay? And uh, and now this text, the blue text, is directly from uh, the actual uh, the actual uh, GAO write-up, and it says Centennial Technologies received the highest confidence rating over all three phases, and it lowered the quoted uh, and it had the lowest quoted price for the BPA call order. Uh, a best value trade-off analysis was not required to be performed. Now. Was there any additional information you wrote as part of your trade-off decision, Andrew? Or was this it? Um, short answer would be no, no, since there wasn't a trade-off. <laughs> okay, got it. That's awesome. And, uh, and I think this is a good lessons learned uh, moment for everyone out there. Now, if you're awarding the highest technically rated and the lowest price, there's nothing to trade off, right? And now the GAO, they've also noted this on several other opinions as well. Um, and so... Uh, one of them being Icon Government Public Health Solutions, just from two years ago. And let's say this as an example, okay? If you have two companies with ratings as high confidence, high confidence, and high confidence, three high confidence, both companies, that doesn't mean that they are equal. And your technical evaluations can determine one as the highest technically rated, since you always have to go beyond the ratings, as what GAO often says. 
So this can often save a lot of time. And what about you on your end, Dave? Did this save you a lot of time, just being able to focus in on just providing this kind of brief uh, explanation of this no trade-off being required? Yeah, it did save a lot of time. You know, with our um, selected awardee being the highest rated and the lowest uh, evaluated price, um, by not having to dive into all the details that go into a trade-off right up. Uh, so we're going to go in a, a bit of a lightning round here and uh, to really uh, look forward. And, and so you awarded this action uh, pretty quickly here and, you know, uh, in September, right? And the vendor protested in October. And the decision from GAO came out in January. So looking at our calendars, that's getting close. That's it's the 100-day mark that they provided the ruling by. Now, and after that, David, how long did it take you to complete the reevaluation of the two phase one quotes from that, you know, the water vendor and the protester? How long did it take you once you got the decision back from GAO? Uh, the reevaluation itself took about two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, so again, very quickly here. And so uh, I want to make sure we point that out here. But uh, now another thing, now being that this was originally competed in FY22 and awarded originally in FY22, but you had the protests, uh, did you get to, when you made the reaward, did you get to use any of those FY22 dollars at all? Yeah, we actually did. Uh, since the funds were obligated prior to that October 1st date, um, you know, um, before the end of the fiscal year, uh, we were able to use those after the protest was resolved. Got it, got it, got it. That's, I think that's great. A little lessons learned for everyone here. You can still use that as part of it. So even though you got a protest and it was the same and you had to reevaluate, you're still able to get this whole work completed in right about that eight month time frame, right? From issuance of the solicitation to award, even with a protest. Uh, so that was huge, very quick. And so they, this team managed the risk, really managed the risk here. And that's very important for everyone to stand. All right, so here we are going back to a protest. And uh, Scott, why don't you go ahead and, and share with us what these other protest points were uh, that uh, that were protested by the vendor. So the vendor really harped on uh, an unstated evaluation criteria. Now this part was not sustained, but they said that uh, the agency shouldn't have dinged them for who participated in the oral presentation and who didn't. And I've got two samples here of the raises expectations of success and lowers. On the left you see the awardees. They had a raises expectations of success because the key personnel participated in the presentation and quote appeared knowledgeable and, con and confident. That's a pretty good raises confidence. But on the right side you can see the protesters. The program manager was the only individual who, present who presented. The only one with no other key personnel speaking. And another executive participated during the oral presentation Q&A, but they're not even gonna be part of the overall delivery team. So when the GAO looked at this, the GAO looked at what was in the solicitation. And they said, the RFQ explicitly notified vendors that the purpose of the, R the oral presentation was to understand the vendor's technical and management approaches and, quote, hear directly from the vendor. They explicitly required the vendor to bring at least three per key personnel and so the GAO says, you know, you were adequately informed that the agency was going to evaluate whether and how well the key personnel delivered on that oral presentation. And here's the language that you can use. This is some sample blue language here. RFQ limited key personnel to five employers employees and specified that at least three of the five needed to be from the prime contract. So on this part of the protest, they were good to go, denied. And now, now it's your turn again. We've got two quick exercises for y'all here. The first one is how to write a good streamlined documentation. We're talking about streamlining things. David and Andrew here, they had to move really fast. And so uh, when you're doing that, you can't take the time to write novels and novels of raises and lowers expectations of success. On the left hand side here, you'll see what probably a lot of us are used to seeing from our con classes for how to write a good raises expectations of success and lowers. But it's probably a lot there. So we can cut a lot of that out. But in order to do so, 
we have to be in the room when it happens. So if I was going to write this, or maybe if David and Andrew would write this, I might just include this first sentence. The vendor offers 100 flavors of ice cream and frozen yogurt in both dairy and non-dairy options. And then if you want, you can have that citation there, offer one proposal. And if you want, you can see all about this on webinar 47, the GAO Perspectives on Procurement Innovations. Now we have a couple, uh, we have a question here from Maud. So what changed through, though, in the reevaluation uh, for them not to protest again? Did you provide more details or a debrief for them uh, to get more details than just the table itself? So David, can you kind of shed some light on everyone? What did your team do? What was that additional documentation? What did that look like there uh, when you went back to reevaluate the vendors, the two vendors in phase one? Yeah, sure. So since we were in FAR Part 8.4, we didn't do a formal debrief. We did a, a brief explanation of the award. Um, and at that, at that time, it was a little higher level. And I think that's kind of what led into the protest. And hindsight, we probably should have added a little bit more details in there. But again, can't always get it perfect. So um, you're right. The, it didn't, the reevaluation didn't change the original results. We did provide them um, um, the, the reevaluation with a little bit more substance. Um, and again, I, just like Scott said, there was a lower confidence just because um, there wasn't as much involvement um, you know, on their presentation as we'd like um, from their staff or their team. Um, so again, we just kind of reiterated uh, that, elaborated, and provided more information. And so that's what, um, again, I'm assuming got them to a point that they didn't want to protest again. Got it. And, uh, and I guess a, a, another thought here, when you, uh, when you went ahead and re-awarded it, so you re-awarded the decision, did the vendor ask for a brief explanation award again? No, so uh, I guess our general practice, and again, this is my first stab at this kind of scenario. So um, we, we provided, once we did the reevaluation, we provide the uh, evaluation results and the notice to both the protester and the awardee. Um, so it kind of was another, it was just kind of a deeper, brief explanation. Um, so that's kind of how that worked. Got it. Okay. That's great. Perfect. Thank you very much for sharing that. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to continue to drop them in the chat there. Uh, we're going to go over here to our uh, next uh, exercise, though, and where we have exercise number two. And so uh, where we have a great sample. And Scott, you want to go ahead and, and uh, tee this up for everybody? Oh, and now you're talking about ice cream samples, David, and I'm getting hungry because it's lunchtime out here on the East Coast. Well, we have to evaluate this. We got our first quote in for the ice cream party. This quote is from Moe's Ice Cream, and we did a very streamlined corporate experience for phase one, just like y'all suggested. We only asked them three questions. To describe the number of flavors of ice cream they have, to describe the number of people that they have served, we're looking for approximately 300, and to describe the non-dairy options that they have available. And here's what Moe's Ice Cream said. Moe's Ice Cream has seven trucks equipped with freezers capable of storing over 100 gallons of ice cream and frozen yogurt. We have catered office parties, birthday parties, and fundraisers with between 100 and 250 people. We have over 50 flavors. The most popular are French vanilla, chocolate cherry swirl, and cotton candy. Well, all right. That's all that Moe's wrote. So now it's your turn to evaluate. Let's pull up a poll, Davis. Have people vote high confidence in this, some confidence in this, or low confidence in this? So take that poll, put it in the chat, let me know what you think of Moe's ice cream with the terms of number of flavors, number of people they've served, and the non-dairy options. High confidence, some confidence, or low confidence? Just, uh, three, two, one, and we'll broadcast here. All right, it looks like looks like oh my goodness it looks like the font is very small for me it looks like 17 percent high 66 percent said some and 17 percent said low so I'm gonna say that we have consensus just gonna declare it here at some confidence I'm gonna hide that now everyone knows that the next thing you do after an on-the-spot consensus is you can't just have the uh, rating you need to have some things behind it too so tell me what are some things that either increase your confidence or decrease your confidence in Moe's ice cream? I saw a fill right out already. 
No non-dairy options. That's a great one. Do you really need to write any more than that? Kia says they've never served more than 250 people. You know, that could be either. They, uh, they don't have the experience serving 300, but you know, it could be that they're close. It depends. Uh, let's see here. Uh, less than, haven't served as many people. Method of refrigeration. Oh, Linda doesn't like their method of refrigeration. Uh, that could be a decreased competence. Um, let's see here. What else do we have here? Uh, not enough people. Haven't served as many people. No non-dairy options. We're looking for 350. You know, these are all great things. And look at that. You know, we didn't write very much here. Uh, we didn't take very long. Um, we didn't ask them how they handled surges, so they didn't provide that. But they did ask, they do, here Jennifer has, they do have lots of flavors. That raises her expectations of success. 50 flavors for Jennifer, that's just about enough. And uh, for me, I know that I'm going to order the chocolate cherry swirl if I get the chance at the uh, summer uh, ice cream party. So if there's leadership out there, people would like a summer Christmas party, off a, uh, ice cream party with uh, at least 50 flavors of ice cream. And I'm voting for chocolate cherry swirl. Great job, everyone. Uh, David, I'm going to turn it back to you. Yeah, and we had a question earlier. It looks like uh, Monica was able to get to it, though. But uh, so in the case with the, the PWS, right? So uh, you don't always have to put a PWS out there. Sometimes it's a statement of work or a statement of objectives. When you're requesting a statement of objectives, the statement of objectives can't be made into the ward itself. So you have to have a PWS to replace it. Uh, and you have options when you do it. So here, this team, David and Andrew, you guys requested it as part of the vendor's solicitation in, uh, in their phase three, right? Now, uh, under the, here, we can use a technique called select best suited to negotiate potentially, which some teams have done. We had a team at USPTO that did this, where they asked for a high summary of the PWS as part of that uh, as part of their phase procurement approach, and then use select best suited to request the full PWS from just the awardee that they found as the best suited contractor. So there's an option there you could do that. You can request the full one. You're going to get that. You're going to replace the statement of objectives with a PWS in some fashion from the vendors before you actually make an award itself. So it's just part of the process there. Um, okay, so perfect. So great answers here. Um, and that 300, Scott, can that 300, could that be looked at as a positive or a negative? Just because we have some language there, flexible language, right, as part of the requirements, uh, saying approximately 300. So does it always have to be a negative if they didn't hit that 300, even though we said approximately? This is where we get back to our very technical weasel words. Weasel words are great for keeping flexibility. And so depending what your marker research shows, you might want to have some flexibility in your language. If you're out there and you know that most companies have had experience with 250 or 300 people, you might want to say, well, we highly desire that you've had 300 people served, but we're happy with this as a minimum. And if someone comes in and says, well, I've done a birthday party for 20, you can say, that's not the same as 300. But if someone's come in and said, well, I did 200, then I did 225, then I did 250, then I did 275, I'm confident that I can do 300, I can say, you know what, I'm confident that you've done 300 too. It all depends. And that's why confidence ratings are the holistic approach. They give you that flexibility, but you got to put the weasel words in there too. David, I think it's time to hear about uh, final thoughts. That's right. And so, David Geary, can you give us any final takeaways, a minute takeaway that you have uh, from looking back at this procurement and just what you want to share with everyone out there? Sure. Um, for me, I think that the live demonstrations, presentations, as well as that um, question answer phase uh, was very helpful to our evaluation team because a lot of times uh, traditional procurements, I mean, you just get a, a huge paper file or, or document file. You got to uh, kind of look through and make your own interpretations. But you know, that, that presentation um, went a long way for our evaluators. As well as the on-the-spot consensus and the confidence rating, it really helped save a lot of time um, and helped us be consistent with our evaluation and kept us on track. Um, I guess the plan uh, for me personally, um, I'm a team lead, so I, I really want to use these techniques, at least consider them going forward and integrating them as we see fit. Great feedback there. All right, Andrew, your turn. Uh, what, what feedback do you have, everyone? What lessons learned do you have? Sure. Uh, number one, I think everyone should try these innovations. Uh, you'll never go back. Um, be willing to take risk and try something new. Uh, 
uh, thankfully we had a CO in David that was willing to do that. Uh, it's funny because you said that the audience was going to be DHS folks, and I was kind of surprised because I already I thought that all the DHS folks were already using these techniques. So um, if you haven't used the pill as a resource, go to those guys. They're really great. I mean, they they put in so much time with us at uh, Ed, and uh, I'm very grateful to them for helping us out. Um, and then finally, I think if we had more time during uh, phase two uh, with the with the demo with the uh, presentations, I would have uh, allowed a little more time and maybe had uh, demos during those instead of uh, just the 45 minutes. Perfect. Excellent. Scott, what about you? Key takeaways. I think the biggest one is uh, the relationship that uh, David and Andrew had built already. Uh, and that was the foundation for letting them try something new. Um, so make sure to try those things new when you have the time because you never know when you're going to need to have that quick procurement come up like they did here and have uh, an FY24 turn into an FY23 and you got to move really fast. So try things when you get the chance and build those relationships, especially now that we're virtual. David, you got any takeaways? I think for me here, I think it's just how quick this team moved. And, you know, Andrew and David, you guys went very quick through the phases. I have never even gone this quick before in a three-phase approach. And just how efficient you were with the evaluating and doing them together as well. I think that's the biggest thing I saw is how you did them together with everyone here, uh, which really made a difference and uh, really sped things up along for the whole process. Well, that does it here for this webinar. And so we like to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, thank you, David Geary. Thank you, Andrew Coco, for taking your time to come out and joining us on our 72nd webinar, and Anne Van Houten as well. And for the hundreds of you here joining us uh, today, too, on the 72nd webinar, we truly hope you're able to provide these innovative techniques on your next procurement as you're closing out the fiscal year, because you can really streamline the process. We have two final polls for you to take, which will help us with improving our classes in the future. So be sure to take these two polls uh, and uh, after the class survey from CSOD. And uh, remember, we have the competing values framework assessment. Be sure to click on the link here on the page. Take the assessment today. Um, that would be really helpful to make sure we're getting enough responses from everyone and really understand the culture of the organization. Now, be on the lookout for our next webinar in July 2023. Right at the end of July, uh, registrations will be available in the next month or so on CSOD. So be on the lookout for that. Just a reminder, if you haven't done so already, Make sure to sign in with your full DHS name and email. And I guess you've got a DHS name and a DHS email. That way you receive your credit in CSOD. Remember, we've got our PillCasts. If you haven't been to our PillCast page on YouTube, check it out. There's a lot of resources, and they're only 10 minutes long. So micro training is available there. You can, of course, visit our Pill homepage to find lots and lots of resources, including a Pill One pager. Like Andrew mentioned at the end there, if you would like pill support, you can email us and you'll find all of our email addresses on our pill page. But you can also submit the pill one pages there if you know that you'd like to submit a team uh, to uh, be coached by the pill. And we've heard some rumors out there that I don't want to be a pill team because then I have to do a webinar. You don't have to do a webinar. David and Andrew just really wanted to. So not every team does a webinar. We've done. 164 teams coached and only 72 webinars. So it's only a 50-50 chance that you're on a webinar. But you do have to be on a PillCast. No, just kidding. Um, so you can you can go to our website for uh, recordings. You can go there for our Pill Yearbook. You can go over there for the workbooks, for the Pill Idea Competition. You can find out about upcoming trainings. You can put in DigiBad submissions. You can do all of those things and more. And over the summertime, we are going to be rolling out a new web page too, so stay tuned for that. Of course, we have the Pill Idea Competition. We have four current open competitions. Uh, the first three are uh, uh, the submissions have closed and they're being evaluated or piloted now. And Fletzy is offering a cash award. So if you're in Fletzy, go take a look at our Pill Idea Competition page and see if you can uh, win some money. Um, I don't work for Fletzy, but maybe I will. Of course, we have 2,726 pill DigiBadge holders. You are also a DigiBadge holder. Um, if you've attended five of these webinars, you can submit yourself to earn a pill DigiBadge. That's the uh, micro-credential we have for innovation, the Shu Ha Ri 
crawl, walk, run. If you have attended five of these webinars, you are automatically contract for the SHU, which is the Procurement Innovation Innovation Practitioner Badge. Um, you can submit your PIL one pager on the PIL homepage. We have a couple of upcoming trainings left. If you haven't taken our newest course, PIL Bootcamp the Next Level, we have two offerings, one on May 23rd and one on June 13th. Sign up for those. We also have PIL Coaching Clinic coming up on June 15th. So if you would like to coach your own teams, David uh, Geary mentioned that he's a, a team lead and he wants to coach teams. If you are like David and want to coach teams too, come on out to Coaching Clinic and learn how to coach teams. Finally, don't forget about the PIL Bootcamp. It's a one-hour session. Uh, the, the PIL Bootcamp Primer one-hour session is out there on FAI.gov. If you need samples, check out the Periodic Table of Acquisition Innovations. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope you take these lessons home, put them into practice. Take care now.